redo saying again, like, it's really nice to meet you guys. And, you know, I appreciate you having me around to help out. It's super cool. Um, my name is Megan Starks. I'm a narrative director at Activision. Uh, so that means I'm in charge of all of the narrative on my project, uh, which is really fun. And before that, I was a game director at Obsidian. And before that, I was a senior narrative designer and content designer at a couple of places in the industry. So. Um, awesome. uh, as a narrative director, what does it feel to be, I mean, that's a pretty, pretty like go <laughs> good goal to hit. Like anybody would be super proud of that. Do you feel like, uh, hey, pinch me, am I dreaming? And it's like, <laughs> like, yeah, for sure. <laughs> like uh, at Activision, I mean, everyone Activision, like, yeah. come on. I mean, no, do you get bigger no, than no, that? Uh, I, don't, so, I don't know what the studio is. Like, like everyone <laughs> in the seats behind you and who's watching, Megan, is going to like want to be where you're sitting, right? Like, tell us what it feels like. Oh, man. I mean, I think it's great. I was always really ambitious, even before I entered the industry when I was in college. You know, I knew that I wanted to be a creative writer. My parents were like, how are you going to support yourself financially? What kind of, <laughs> you know, what jobs are out there for that? But, you know, I was very, like, dogged and that, like, this is what I want to do. Um, I wanted to go into video games. And eventually I wanted to be in a creative director type role of like, you know, I want to have ownership and make yeah. decisions and yeah. stuff like that. It's a very long road. Obviously, you know, I, I didn't have that as my first job. But here I am, you know, 13 years later in the industry. But um, I do think that if it's something that you're aspiring, you know, to climb the ladder and have creative ownership of your department, it's absolutely doable and mm. is a great goal to work towards. And it's very rewarding as well. Yeah, I mean, amen to that. Like, we, this whole, we've been talking to, like, the, the heavy hitters of the industry all night. Um, and there's this common thread with people that uh, have found success. And it's, they found failure first. Um, oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and, <laughs> and that's the thing that they always kind of say, hey, that was the thing that made me or, or built me or made me better. You know, and, and I mean, is there like maybe a, um, an antidote that you can kind of talk to about that? Like where maybe there was a, a moment in your career where it was like, like uh, a change uh, uh, in you and an evolution that was very, very um, noticeable. Pivot where, points. Yeah. Like, can you kind of give us a couple of those or, or to the audience? Sure. I mean, I think it's been a series of you know, learning and improving through failures over time, right? So one of the things that I was thinking about is I never, like, I went to school for creative writing, but I was never the most talented writer in the room, right? Mm. And even now, you know, I have a team of narrative designers, and I wouldn't consider myself the most talented writer. So really, it's about, like, um, perfecting your skill through hundreds of thousands of hours of practice and being willing to, like, do the time, put your seat in the butt, right for eight hours straight, yeah. um, learn other departments um, so you can spread out your area of expertise. Um, but also, yeah, what you're talking about is I, not everything that I've worked on has been a success right from the start. It's like, you know, my first job was not at a AAA company. And that's totally fine. Um, it gave me the opportunity to learn and grow and improve. And even like today, all the things that I work on, not everything is perfect the first time, you know, if it's not, you just go, okay, what can I learn from that? And how can I do better next time? And I actually think you learn more from mm. things messing up than if everything had been perfect and easy the whole way, you know? Same again and again. Yep. The yeah. same exact thing again and again. Well, you know, with what, each and every one of them. But it's the same. It's like, it's like when you, you people with success in this industry, and I think, for any industry, especially in the creative, you're going to hear people at a high level repeat themselves. Um, and they're reinforcing something that's important to say. One thing about Megan that I want to say is me and Megan have worked um, on some, some projects together. And Megan, you, what, what I find compelling about you is your ability to work really seamlessly with, with other people, but your ability to find really uh, have it, you're in ideas woman like every <laughs> every time i feel like i would talk to you you had some quirky idea and twist on a thing and and i was like i love that and it was always i love that i love that and you don't really do that within this like 
we all have great ideas, but like Megan's always bringing these like really cool ideas. Like the thing I, I always thought was, was funny was, um, I don't know if we can talk about this one. It was a, about adding different personalities to a robot thing um, without mm -hmm. getting into details. But I was like, oh my God, like, I want to do that. I want that so bad. <laughs> um, and just to, just to give you a kind of a compliment, you know, um, and also another reason why I felt it was important to bring you and, and, and invite you and see if you wanted to do this was, was because you're not afraid to say things uh, and say ideas and you're like, I'll put, mm -hmm. I'll put myself out there and, and like, I don't care. Like, I think it's a good idea. I think that's, that's mm -hmm. empowering. Um, maybe, maybe talk to that a little bit. Like what, what makes sure. you, it's like, what makes you gonna like have that spark? Yeah, actually, you know, that's something I talked about recently with my husband even because he's in the industry, but in a different discipline. And the longer we're in the industry, we started noticing things about like the people who get their work accepted and in the game, the people who get ahead and get promotions and um, things like that. They're not necessarily the people who are like, oh, they're so much better than everybody else. They have the perfect yeah. ideas. They're yeah. just the people who feel comfortable in saying, here's 10 things, I'm going to throw spaghetti at the wall. If one of them is cool, awesome. And then so you don't get too precious about your ideas. You try to take inspiration from a bunch of different areas. You try to make it a collaborative effort. Like it can't all be me, 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 right? You're right. partnering with someone else and you want them to get excited and you want to know what they're interested in and try and bridge the gap or come up with something that is, uh, you know, will excite them. And I think the more that you do that and you get comfortable with being willing to throw something out, even if it's like, oh, this might be dumb, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but like, it might not. <laughs> um, so I think those are the best things, like make sure that you're, you speak up, you're heard in meetings, but you're also promoting other people and making it a back and forth conversation. Yeah, and you know, I just, I'm putting, I just put together a, a masterclass about what you just said. And <laughs> like, we don't, we talk a lot about technical things and using MetaHuman, this and that. And yeah. that's great. Like, we need to know that. Of course. But the things Megan is talking about are equally or more important, actually. It's a 50-50. Um, it's a 50-50. And you have to be balanced in this area. Like, soft skills are important, but being able to work mm -hmm. well with people is also important. And like, obviously, knowing how to do the job is another part of it. I mean, it's a trifecta. But Megan, I, I put together a master class specifically to talk about sharing a vision. And so being cool. selfless in your vision and saying, you know yeah. what, it's not my vision, it's our vision, you know? Yeah. And I think that's very understated in our business. A lot of people show up and they're like, hey, it's my idea. And you know, some yeah. those people have a big ego and a strong personality and people kind of like, okay, let's do the thing and worker bees go do worker bee stuff. And I think mm -hmm. that will always be prevalent in a creative industry, but I like to see our industry pivot, and I'm seeing it more and more, and I'm trying to drive it, of com coming in and, and, and having that boardroom of people, of experts of what they do, and respecting these great ideas and finding the source of truth. In, and maybe yeah. like, hey, I love that idea. What if this? Oh my God, what if that? And, like, and you, you come out the other end like, with the best thing. Like I'm in a writer's room right now every week, and the best ideas I've ever heard are the ones that I'm not coming up with. Yeah. And, but it's, I'm <laughs> yeah, driving it. I'm like, shit, how did you connect that thought? Like, <laughs> I love it. And I love that feeling. And can talk about writing. Let's talk about narrative. You're putting together, we're not going to talk about your project, but you're putting together an amazing thing right now. Can you go, without talking about what it is, can you talk about finding the soul and the heartbeat of a story? Wow, that's an interesting one. Uh, okay, real quick before I jump into that, I just wanted to double click on a point you said, which goes back to that idea of you don't have to be the most talented person in the room. Yeah. Like you don't have to be the best programmer on the team. I, the more that I've seen as I go on in the industry, we kind of have like the, you know, no assholes rule, right? Where yeah, it's yeah. like, yeah. it's more important that you work well with other people and it's a collaborative effort. Yeah, um, so, point. and also yeah. the idea that everybody here was hired for a reason. We're all equally skilled. We're all equally experienced. Or if you're just starting off, you're eventually going to be there and part of the more experienced people, it's their job to train you up to, you know, take the reins and be the next generation. So I think that respect for each other and thinking of yourself as one team, everybody's efforts, you know, lifts the entire game um, is really important. Um, going to finding the heart of a story. There 
are many different ways you could go about that, right? So it's like one of those things that um, I always tell people is like constraints are great. The worst thing you can have is like a blank page because yeah, it could, could be anything. It could be a million different things. Um, so really what you want to try and do it. is define mm -hmm. a box for yourself to work within. Um, and that could be anything from like, hey, what is our game genre? You know, is it first person or third person? Is it high fantasy or sci-fi or um, a modern day military? You know, it could be any number of things. So you just start um, defining the different parameters of what is the, the project that you're all trying to make. And then within that, you start thinking about what are interesting themes um, and experiences that people are dealing with today, what would resonate with a larger audience, what lived experiences have I had that I want to speak to or explore out um, in a healthy way. Uh, I think one reason why people go into the entertainment industry <clears throat> is like a love of consumption, right? So it's like, I love reading, I love playing games, I love watching movies, and why is that? Um, you know, not only are they entertaining, but they make me feel something. And they also let me explore different scenarios in a safe way. So I try to bring the same thing to whatever I'm creating to provide that for other people. <laughs> that yeah, covered a lot. <laughs> Hopefully that made sense. Honestly, no, we, no, it's we, awesome. we could do a whole yeah. day on, I, I on think, this I type think of with stuff. Ev with yeah. everyone today, we could make like a... A hold, uh, well, that, hold of... that's why we should, you know, let Megan know. Like Megan, we're, we're thinking about next year, maybe bringing, you know, um, everybody a whole shuttle. Yeah, like so, everybody come to. Macedonia. Oh, that would be so cool. Yeah, and and kind of yeah, expanding. Yeah, you could do on, a whole like PowerPoint presentation on any aspect. <laughs> absolutely, of that. absolutely. <laughs> That'd be fun. Google, Google slides. You know, uh, we were doing a Q and A before in between segments um, between a panel, and uh, there was a question about who's your least favorite character in games. And I was like, oh, I, I know. Wow. I always we always think about our favorite characters, but the you know, I, it made me think, you know. And I I, I kind of want to circle that question and come back to you, and not specifically talk about your favorite or, or least favorite character, but like why it's important to have characters that we empathize with as players, you know, to help with mm -hmm. the the immersion of of getting lost in, in a story and 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 loving or hating characters, like when you get into a character design. Like you've created some really amazing characters. Like I, I know firsthand from that. Um, like what's your process of trying to find a character and make somebody that, that is memorable and that players would love or hate intentionally, by the way. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk about a little bit about your sort of how, how you pragmatically approach things like that? Sure. I mean, okay, so again, with defining your constraints, right? When you think about the other characters in the game, you want to make sure that your character doesn't overlap too much with any pre-established territory. Part of that is why you have a lead, you know, and director, so they can help guide everyone's efforts to make sure, hey, we're, we're covering uh, a good variety of stuff and not just um, repeating. Um, and then beyond that, you kind of think about uh, creating variety for yourself and what you're writing and what you want to accomplish in the game. Like, do you want this character to be likable and empathetic? And it's like um, players will think of them as like a best friend or like, oh, you know, I have to protect them. They're so precious, blah, blah, blah. Do you want them to make people angry? Do you want them to be biting? Um, do you want them to be good or evil? So there's all these sorts of decisions that can flesh out to make an interesting character. But the main thing is they need to be relatable. So if people don't understand why they're doing something, then they'll just be annoyed or dislike them, right? So you have to think about their motivations. Um, and the difference between a hero and a villain, a lot of times I feel like is how far they're willing to go to accomplish their goal. So mm. if your motivation is provide resources for your family, that's extremely relatable. It's a very human experience. Almost anybody can understand. I have a family. I love them. They're important to me. I don't want them to suffer or die. So I'm going to do what I can to get resources. A hero will not cross a line to hurt others to do that, but a villain might be willing to burn the entire world down right. to provide for their loved one, right? right? So you just kind of make those types of little decisions all along the way to craft the type of character you're interested in. Uh, I wanted to ask, like, you said all the characters have to be relatable. And when you mm -hmm. do games, you, you tend to ship them worldwide. How do you not yep. narrow it down, but how do you make it so that everyone in the world can understand how much 
uh, how much of that is uh, coming into thought when you're creating those characters? That's a good question. Well, that is really interesting, actually. We've done user research early on in projects to say these are our biggest markets that we're going to ship within. So what are the things that those markets are interested in, right? Um, we, you don't necessarily, uh, you wouldn't get as much return on your investment, like time spent creating something versus the amount of those people playing the game. But, you know, if you try to literally support every single um, experience and culture and yep. things like that. So yep. you kind of aim it at like, these are big markets. But even within that, there is, you know, a universal human experience. I know that, you know, European countries will have a very different experience from American, you know, states, right? We've and seen that. so on and so forth. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, some things are kind of universal, like, you know, love for others, um, ambition, wanting to provide for yourself, you know, war, um, sickness, uh, and some of them will be timely based off of like, you know, you could talk about climate change or AI or, or things like that, right? So you just think about what people in the world are experiencing and going through and then dig down into that. Um, within specific cultures, so if we were looking at like, let's look at American culture, blah, blah, blah. A lot of times what you'll see in genre, like fantasy or sci-fi, they're using fictional concepts to get at what, um, you know, society is dealing with. Yeah. Like, yeah. how do we feel about, you know, way back in the day, minority interracial couples, like mm -hmm. they'll explore that with, you know, um, fantasy uh, creatures of different species, for example. Yeah, yeah like it's, it's so I'm taking a, um, a political topic that is, mm -hmm. uh, di you know, it could divide your audience and, and framing it through something else and changing the character archetypes and, but still being relevant without being overly in your face about it. Mm -hmm. you know, I think that's the best type of storytelling. And actually it reminded me before, I want to circle back to something you said that I always think about in the world of star Wars. I mean, who doesn't love the original first, mm -hmm. first three or four, <laughs> yeah. five, six, four, five, six. Yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's a dope. story about the most epic thing even imaginable. But you know what it's really about? A story about family. Yeah. It's a story about yep. a father <laughs> and a sister and finding yourself in this world. That's what makes it Absolutely. super compelling. It's, I mean, in all, it's the set piece that is epic. It's the lightsaber set and yeah. the shooting and everything. But it's, but it's Luke's just... desire to find yeah. his reasoning of his father's and yeah. that whole relationship, right? And his sister and all that. But like, that's important, right? And like, and when we have these big games like God of War, it's the same yep. sort of thing yep. going on, right? Like we see these. Yeah, mirrors. it's a dad trying, or a, really a warrior trying to figure out how to be a dad while yeah. dealing with grief of losing his wife, right? Like it yeah, just. Yeah. And if you look at um, Greek mythology, they're basically a soap opera back in the day, right? right? Yeah, look right, at Game yeah. of Thrones; it's all about family dynamics. So yeah. Yeah, yeah and even I love that. especially if you play like the, the earlier games of of God of War, like some people just played the, the first one. It's like how much you can you can translate from earlier games into, into newer games and without milking it. That, that's the most important thing. Like we talked previously, like the newest God of War doesn't feel doesn't feel milk no, at all. No, it doesn't. It feels genuine. Yeah, it does. It feels genuine. And a lot of that, you know, a lot of that comes from and stems from uh, a narrative director like pushing these ideologies and, and enforcing stuff like this to have story everywhere. You know, and have have themes and subtext everywhere. I mean, yep. a, a cinematic game doesn't mean I'm walking through and it's Megan, you, walking you hear me say this, I think, a bunch of times already. But I, I repeat it because that's what we do. We say the same things over and over again. Um, but a cinematic game doesn't mean I'm a character and I get to a thing and a cinematic ha happens and then I get back in gameplay. It's all cinematic. Yep. It's mm -hmm. all yep. subtext. It's all ca there's characterization in everything. Right, and that's what makes a game compelling. That's what makes you coming back for more. Why do we like Red Dead yep. so much? Why do we like The Last of Us so much? Because the entire experience feels like I'm playing a movie. It's not because it's one giant cinematic. Cinematics yep. Yep. are not, I hate the word cinematic, honestly, I really do. <laughs> because it's, that's, it's that's such a, first. it triggers me now. Like I'm like, nah. Really? But, but um, Megan, well, what yeah, are, everything yeah. that you're doing, you have different tools that you're pushing and pulling to try and get an emotional response out of right. your audience, right? Right. So, so um, because technology is getting better and it's becoming more realistic, so 
basically we are uh, we are playing a movie yeah so how is your writing like change because previously it's like uh, it's a gameplay and it's uh, you have a cinematic but now because you're going to see everything very realistically right. in five years so how the writing will change and how you're going to develop that Gosh, I think if you look at old school RPGs, they are very text heavy because you're meant to, you know, you're sitting there and you're controlling your character and you're having a break in combat. And it's like, hey, I'm having an experience of writing and reading a novel or a short story. And it feels good to the brain when mm -hmm. you do that. Mm -hmm. You know, you're reading some text and you have time. You can breathe, relax, you know, learn some of the world lore, experience some emotions, pick up your quest and go back out there. A lot of uh, more modern RPGs um, try, are simulating a, you know, movie going, watching a film type experience as part of that. So it's still very fast paced um, and it's much more, uh, you know, back and forth dialogue um, which creates a different type of feeling in the brain, I think. So you just kind of have to keep that in mind. What do you want the effect to be in the audience and uh, tailor your writing to support that? Yeah, I have to commend one uh, game that's currently in development, Hellblade 2. Oh Senua my God. Saga. Yep. That's, uh, in, in, in the most recent years, I think that's one of the best masterpieces of cinematography and yes. games. Like there, there was a trailer, like five, or not trailer, but the gameplay, six yeah, or like seven a days day, ago. Yeah, a couple days ago. It's, yeah. it's insane. <laughs> it's you know, actually insane. You know, they're doing that project. I did a masterclass also on streamlining teams yeah. and, and doing more with less. And because it's all about pre-production and, and sharing the vision and all this magical stuff that, that teams are starting to really pick up on. You don't need sometimes a thousand people. You need a group of people that are passionate, that, that are like-minded and that understand what you're making. That team, people may not realize this, but the team that makes Hellblade, is actually would you you could consider uh, like a big indie team? Yeah, they're a yeah, small yeah. group of people with not a shit, shit ton of money. Excuse my French. Yeah, um, <laughs> putting out stuff that everyone else is with much bigger budgets and much bigger teams. Like I, I can't even make that. Yeah, you know, and it's because of that philosophy. It's a, it's because about leaning into pre-production and getting it right before you go into production. It really is a a a, a, a shift in how we do things. A lot of studios, they want to be on a schedule and they say, hey, we're going to be in production by then. But if you don't have all this ready, you're not going to make a Hellblade. Nope. You know, you're going to make something and it's going to be a Frankenstein and you're going to redo it. <laughs> the worst thing about game development is coming out of your vertical and horizontal slice and not really knowing what you're making. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> yeah, 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 I mean, I, we've all been there. Um, Megan has been there. I've been there. It's, it's tough. And you lose people, right? You lose people on, yep. on the team. And I think the hardest thing about game development is keeping your best people yeah. because that's your creative yeah, family, I agree. you know, and you want to go into battle with them. And battle is not battling production or time or money. It's battling the forces that want to make the team fall apart. And uh, there's so many things that go into that. But the biggest thing that goes into it is not knowing what you're making as a group, you know, and not having good leaders and sharing the vision and, um, yeah, so. Yeah, that is a really good point. It can very easily become too many cooks in the kitchen. So you want yeah. your creative leadership at the very top to be aligned with each other first and foremost, and then understand how to uh, communicate that vision cohesively and, you know, not over, not in a not overcomplicated way down through every level. Um, so, so that you do know what you're making and everyone is, you know, doing one concerted effort and rolling forward and making good progress. I love that. Awesome. Um, how are we doing on time? I one think, minute. yeah, we have one minute left. Okay. Well, <laughs> you know, I, I think I'd like to, uh, and, and Megan, please um, uh, leave us with some final comments, but I would like to say thank you for, for yeah, joining definitely. us. Um, everybody that joined this um, panel, uh, this series of, of podcast uh, uh, conversations was was handpicked for a reason, um, you know. And I think that you bring a lot to the table. I think that this is a very insightful conversation from someone like you, and the point of view from a narrative point of view and a leadership point of view and at Activision is is very critical for people watching. Um, so I just want to say on behalf of everybody here, yeah, thank, thank thank you for being. Woo. here. <laughs> Yeah.
Thank you so much. Okay, last thing I'll say before I go is just um, for anyone thinking about getting into the industry or wanting to climb the ladder over time, uh, be tenacious and be persistent. That's the main thing is like any creative endeavor, you're going to get a lot of rejection. You're going to hear no all the time. Just keep going. And if you think about where you start and where you can go, like think about when you're first doing art as a kid or when you very first started writing, you're going to improve if you practice daily, you know, by leaps and bounds over time. So even if people say no right now, they'll say yes in the future. And also like every amazingly super talented creative person from, you know, like Sylvia Plath to, um, you know, like Steven Spielberg have gotten crazy rejections, right? So yeah. even really good people here know. So keep going. <laughs> Love that. Awesome. Well, th thank you, Megan. Woo.